Tell me if that's loud enough. So, I guess what I'll do here is I'll do a little bit of a chord by chord analysis. So, I think I may have to do that chord symbol? Would that do it? Yeah, that would do it. Okay. Uh, how, mu how much different do I want to do this from the actual arrangement? That's the question. PX Little Link, I know you're one of my students. I just don't know which one. I think it's Chase. Uh, um, um, I want to do something kind of uh, chromatic here. Okay, it's not Chase. That means it's Cameron, which is also Chase. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Uh... If you're still hurt, that means you're Sarah. I'm just going to keep guessing people, because it makes you angry that I'm doing that. Uh, let's do this as a D over F sharp. Oh no, let's actually use the sharp symbol. Do that. That's not letting me. Let's just keep moving down in parallel motion. Yes, it's Sarah Cough. Oh, is Sarah sick? There, that's a chord progression. It can't be Ryan twice, so it's got to be someone other than Ryan. Yes, Chase and Cameron before me. Well, okay. So, I don't know. Something about the, the fact that your username says Link in it made me think that it was Chase or Cameron because it makes me think of Zelda. Of course, I guess the word little should have been my clue. Oh, wait, this is supposed to be bass. Oh. oh, wait, I didn't do the inversion. Ah! Okay, uh, I think I've put myself in a bad situation. Because I've got this downward motion here. Now I'm going to plan out open and closed. Do open here. This this we definitely have to close it up here. I don't think I can I can open it up here because it's gonna make the tenor leap really far. Because here this is a G chord, the mid tenor is gonna be on B. I guess that's not the end of the world. I could do open here. B down to G is what would happen here. Yeah, Sarah, I think you're so far behind it's beyond saving, although I think the only reason you're working on it is because uh, because there's no school. So you're like, hey, suddenly I want to do the thing. Brian, I appreciate you stopped watching The Mandalorian, but I am disappointed it took you a global pandemic for you to actually start watching it. Uh, we're going to stay open here. Oh, no, I don't like that. I don't like that. Because this leap in the bass means that the tenor is going to be like doubling the third here. So I've got to be close. No. Then this could be open. But it's going to be awkward because we're going to be on E. No, we're going to be on A here. No, it works. Okay. And then we'll, clo we'll, we'll have closed because it's, it's an octave between the A and A here because it's a D chord and we're avoiding F sharp. So it's A, D, A. We can keep it closed. And here, I think we're going to have to be closed. Oh, I made a bad. I made a dumb. Because we've got the bass moving down in harmony, which means we're going to have to be closed to open. But then we have an issue here. And whenever your issue is parallel motion between bass and soprano, parallel third here, it's, it sounds good in theory, except what you're going to end up doing is going between closed and open harmony. So because the soprano's... Oh, I screwed up. Because the soprano's on its way down, we're going to go open. I know how we fix this. E minor over G means that we don't have to do parallel inner voices. 
So all I'm doing is an E in the alto as opposed to a D in the alto. The office is cold, and the alternative is the office would be hot. I'm a little bit cold right now. Uh, we're going to do closed here. Just an octave between soprano and tenor. And then go to an honest to god F chord after that. Then definitely closed here. We're going to double someone in the inner voices here. Okay, same chord twice in a row. Do I just do the same voicing twice? Yeah, I guess that's what I'm doing. And then definitely closed harmony here, and then closed, and then closed. That's how we're going to do it. That's what's happening. So, voice two, here's the alto. Open. Hmm. Yeah, let's just let's just do a voice transfer between the just have them switch. And then from here this is a G chord. Closed harmony to open. See? So that G right there is gonna be down to the tenor. And then open here. The A is gonna be in the tenor. And then here is closed. All that means is that there's gonna be an octave between the soprano and the tenor. And here we go. Closed, and then back to open, and then closed again, meaning the octave. Oh, that could potentially, no, not, yeah, it's going to be a voice transfer in the tenor. Doing closed harmony. Do I want to double? Yeah, let's double those two voices there. I've got to use the pop notation. Roman numerals aren't going to work in Sibelius. It's, a, it's not ideal. Maybe I'll, I'll analyze it when I'm done, so then you can see in all of its glory. Now, here's an interesting thing. Because of what's happened, I'm going to have some issues here. I'm going to frustrate the leading tone and just double do here and not have a fifth in this chord. Now let's go to the tenor. Yay, good old tenor part. That's easy so far. What I've done is I've taken that G that's not being said, sung here and put it down here. Take that G, put it down there. Take that A, put it down here. And then the, the octave between the soprano and the tenor, doubling the fifth. And then here's a full closed harmony voicing of a G major triad. Now here is an open voicing, so we're actually going to have the A here and work up and do a voice transfer. Do, Ti, La, La, Ti, Do in the tenor and the soprano and keep it here and keep it here and so this is the same voicing of the same F chord that's easy right there but then this right here this G7 over B is going to be troublesome not ideal it's the only way to get the chord fully voiced but with, let's find out if Ryan has an issue with this because Ryan has issues with things so that means that the alto could be here, and I don't have to frustrate the leading tone. Oh, wait, what am I doing? I, I don't know what I did wrong. Burn it all. Let's start again. Did that, that, okay, I'm hoping that worked. Okay, so this should be Doti, Doti Fami is interesting enough to be. Oh, interesting enough to be acceptable. I like how it's complaining about putting the alto here, which to me means that the entire line is being treated as soprano voice. Because you can't, Sibelius doesn't know how to make two instruments have a dual identity of range within the same line. So it's, it's complaining about this G because it thinks that sopranos are singing it. So let's listen to this. Uh, let's fix the tempo, actually. Uh, metronome mark. Go... Quarter equals 70. Uh, 
Hey, I dig it. The reason I went with the 5-4 was actually it's, uh, the rhythm itself is inspired by pictures at an exhibition. So why don't we do a lecture? You guys want to do a lecture? Because I can use the dry erase board. I'm super excited to show you this. When I switch to here, I'm not crazy about the frame rate, but check it out. Dry erase board. I'm going to keep my phone over here so I can see what's going on. Boom, right there. Uh, today's lecture is on chapter 10, which is a review for Bell. <laughs> okay, let's talk about phrases, shall we? Tell me if this audio is good because I am my back is turned to the microphone at this point. And uh I also need to get my markers. There's my markers. Where are my markers? Are they underneath these arms? I'm also dropping my markers everywhere. Ugh, okay. No, I'm going to make it through this week, and it's going to be fine. So I have marked on my board, actually, where I should not write, because it won't show up on the camera. Okay, Ryan found his book. We're in Chapter 10 uh, of 8th Edition. I don't know that you have 8th Edition, so you're going to have to find cadences, phrases, periods, and sentences, which might actually be Chapter 10. I'm not crazy about this frame rate if it's streaming the way that, it, that it's showing on my screen. Maybe my screen is just going to show something uh, skippy. So what we're talking about is that phrases are uh, either two measures, four measures, or in rare cases, eight measures. Frame rate is a bit, yeah, the frame rate is trash. Just be slow when you're writing on the board. Oh, awesome, Ryan. Well, uh, the main thing is that I want you to be able to see what's on the board. So uh, what we're talking about here is that you tend to get phrases in uh, groups of two. So phrases, in, in uh, classical music and in popular music tends to be in two measures, four measures, or eight measure chunks. We end, up, we end up grouping them in groups of two. In the case of 12 bar blues, we end up with three groups of four measures. That ends up with 12 bars. I will try to fix the frame rate. It might be a setting, but I'm just not sure what's causing it. Maybe if I lower the resolution, it won't be skippy. Okay, much better, awesome. So when we have two phrases that work together, we end up with one phrase that's asking a question and another phrase answering a question. Uh, and, and yeah, asking a question, answering a question. So does anyone have the name of that for me? What are the, what's the word for the question and what's the word for the answer? I'll hold my phone over here so I can not walk in front of the camera. The name for the question and the name for the answer in musical phrases when you pair them together. Yes. Uh, very close, Bell. Very close. Antecedent is actually the question. I am writing a lot slower now. I'm also leaving out letters. So that's, that's something I'm doing. Yep, Ryan got it. Antecedent consequent. How do we know that the first phrase was the question and the second phrase was the answer? The ending note is a big one, Bell. Uh, the first phrase ended on scale degree five, or in solfage, sol. Whereas the second phrase, because questions always come before answers. That's a really good answer, but it's also not correct enough according to the terminology I use. Yes, Ryan, uh, yes. So Ryan and Bell are correct here as far as a musical answer to my question in a music class, which is, that the uh, first phrase ends on category five and the second phrase ends on category one. So even if uh, I were to play the first phrase ending, tell me if I'm still loud over here, I'm gonna talk a little bit louder. I need two cameras so I can switch to one on the piano. So the antecedent could be like this. That was probably 
probably really bad because what I did was I, I turned the subdominant note of La into a dominant tone, putting it as a ninth over five. No one likes for the uh, antecedent phrase of old 100th to end on an imperfect authentic cadence, which is scale degree five over a tonic triad. That's just kind of hokey. But it was an example of a situation where even scale degree five itself could be the uh, melody note for a tonic triad at the end of an authentic cadence, resulting in an imperfect authentic cadence. Now, if I were to end on a uh, scale degree five is, is uh, the melody and I end on a dominant triad, it would sound like this. Good, I'm glad the piano quality is good. there we haven't arrived so I have somewhere to go so we're not we're done not only harmonically because let's let's write let's, let's write on the board real quick not even not only harmonically are we done because we go Da, 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 and then in on a five chord, a whole bunch of other chords here, because this is a lot of quarter notes in the opening phrase. But then the next phrase does da, 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 end on one, and not only that, but five to one. That's our other authentic cadence, uh, our perfect authentic cadence, which over here is a half cadence. So the fact that the melody itself is category five, category one is, is the more important thing that melodically, as Bell said, we're not there yet until category one at the second phrase. Where did my phone go? Oh, there it is. Martin Luther would be proud. Uh, he would also have something to say about uh, race issues, but that's a whole other issue. So, when we talk about any state of consequence, we're saying there's a musical question that often the musical question has somewhere to go. That somewhere to go would be scale degree one in a tonic triad. That's the somewhere to go. As for what the question is, the question might be a dominant triad, so a half cadence at the end of the first phrase. It might just be uh, that other thing that I did. An imperfect authentic cadence with scale degree five as the melody notes. It was a tonic triad at the end of the first phrase. There's still somewhere to go. The fact that there's a tonic triad at the end of the first phrase does, phrase does not inherently mean we're there yet. Because you would hear the incomplete nature of a different tone other than the root. So here we go. Here's what it would sound like if an imperfect authentic cadence completes the first phrase. I'm clearly not there yet. Now I'm there yet. So let's move on. We've talked about antecedent consequent, but there is a term for what that is called, the concept. Let's actually change colors. The concept of this. What is the name for the concept of antecedent consequence? Brian, you are like three steps ahead of me. It actually is called a period. Everything's freezing. Okay, we will find a solution to this. That's why we're doing this test stream. I'm gonna go through the settings and see what it is that I've done wrong. It could be that it's blowing up my computer and I've got to take my really awesome gaming rig here simply so I have enough processing power to do this. Yes, this is just a text, test lecture. That's why I've gone back to the beginning of chapter 10. So the, the uh, term for antecedent consequent is period. So when I say this is a period, you know that I'm talking about antecedent consequent or musical question and musical answer. Good for Ryan. Well, I know that it's skipped because I'm seeing it skip on my screen, which probably means I need to take my awesome gaming computer I just built and have it in my office, which will be the best thing ever. 
have it in my office. So if I want a game, I've got to come here and leave my house during a quarantine. So there's that. So, board is full of stuff. I still got room to fill stuff on the board. A review of the types of cadences. Brian, better not finish that meme. Okay, okay, Brian. You, you know what, Ryan? You know what? I worked really hard. We got the most important board, which is the tonic triad. We got the subdominant triad. So we've got the tonic, the subdominant, and the dominant. And when we end a phrase on the tonic, there are two ways that we can lead to the tonic triad. Uh, one is with the subdominant, and one is with the dominant. This is the weaker way to lead to the tonic triad, which is with the subdominant, four to one, and we call that the plagal cadence. Whereas the stronger way to lead to the tonic triad is authentic cadence. I'm just really enjoying the chat right now. This is actually really entertaining, so I stopped the lecture so I could read about Clue and Salem and DMC basement with the crowbar. Like, I'm really enjoying this. Especially because it's Ashley and she knocks my music off my stand every day. So five to one is the authentic cadence because dominant has the function of leading to one. That's what we call dominant function in the first place. I'm waving my arms around knowing it's gonna full, it's gonna skip on the camera. You can feel the salt, Sarah. I don't know why you would feel the salt about my music getting knocked off of my stand. Like who would get salty about that? So let's say uh, let's take the authentic cadence. Make two versions of it. First, we have the one that goes five to one. Then we have the one that goes five, four, seven to one. So, which one? I'm enjoying the chat still. Uh, which one uh, of these do we know beyond a shadow of a doubt? I haven't given you any additional information. Which one of these is the imperfect authentic cadence? Which one of these? So the authentic cadence, uh, which, which type of authentic cadence incorporates the possibility of the leading tone chord? No one's answering. They're all typing. It takes them a long time to say imperfect authentic cadence. Three by Lord. Uh, so right here, the imperfect authentic cadence is the one that has the possibility that a leading tone chord could lead to one. But there's other factors. For example, the one could be inverted. The tonic triad at the end of an imperfect authentic cadence could be inverted. Or the melody could be scale degree three or scale degree five. So in, in uh, video and audio froze for a hot second. Got it, I, I need to bring my good computer. That's good to know. Not salty about that at all. But there is a reason I bought it, which is this one's garbage and has a loud fan. So when you look here, the bass is on, that's an arrow and it looks like scale degree one. Yeah, that's an arrow. Uh, the inverted tonic triad involves the bass being on scale degree three or me in solfege. Whereas not having uh, the melody on do means that me or sol is where the melody is. So what you should be getting from this is that there's two ways to achieve in an imperfect authentic cadence. One is we lead to the tonic triad via the leading tone chord. Another is that the bass is not on, on scale degree one, do. Or the third way is the melody is not on scale degree one or do. Now the perfect authentic cadence means that five leads to one and the bass is not inverted and the melody is on Do. So you already have the two types of authentic cadences and the playable cadence. And there is one more that we care about. Uh, there's two more, but there's one more that really matters. So I'm curious if uh, Ryan, I mean, if anyone has the answer for what is the other most common type of cadence. Because the plagal is not that common. It's most commonly found at the end of a hymn. But there is a type of cadence that is almost as common as the authentic cadence. 
It does involve one of these three chords. Tonic, subdominant, my hand is skipping, it's awesome. Or dominant. See, my hand is really fast. Half cadence. Yes, half cadence. Ryan, you didn't get the answer because your phone is bad. So if we end, uh, if we go like anything to dominant, then we get the half cadence. Now, it's usually going to be a subdominant function chord. This is my hand. It's, it's gesturing in an Italian sort of way. Leading to five uh, via a subdominant function chord, such as the subdominant itself, is the most common way to lead to a half cadence. Uh, it could also just be the tonic triad. Sometimes it's the 164, if you've already learned about that, which all of you have. But the point of the half cadence is ending on a chord that implies forward motion. If I were to end a phrase on imperfect authentic cadence, like it was the antecedent phrase, then yes, there is a place to go because something's off with that tonic triad. Either the way it was led to, or the fact that the melody and bass are not both on scale degree one. But ending on a half cadence means that harmonically there's somewhere else to go. Whereas an imperfect authentic tends to be melodically there's still somewhere to go. And then there's one more type of cadence. I'm going to play it for you. See, you, did you hear how unsatisfying that was? So which one was that? Which type of cadence was that? I don't know what I did with my marker. Deceptive cadence, Mel has it. Okay, Sarah, since you're upset, I will do it again. Is that better? I could have led to an inverted six chord. Whole belt. Oh, like I could wear it. Oh, that's really cool. So let's use, let's use um, brown to circle all the cadences now. Legal, authentic, perfect authentic, imperfect authentic, half cadence, deceptive cadence. So then we'll draw an arrow over here. There's only five. Yes, thank you. I, I appreciate that you enjoyed my shaving a haircut PAC. So now let's look at the book. I'm going, to I'm going to play some examples for you. Because to understand how phrases work, we've got to understand the effect that each type of cadence has. I will play a phrase, and you tell me what type of cadence it ends on. The circles didn't load all at once. I drew them all at the same time. I'm that fast. So what type of cadence is this? You are correct that it is a, an authentic cadence, but where is Do? Yes, it's a perfect authentic because the melody and the bass are both on scale degree one. The example here is an E minor, so listen again. Now let's hear another example. Uh, the example is going to start in F minor. It will end in A flat major. So here's the note the melody ended on. Here's the note the bass ended on. I'll give you the last two bars of that example. 
that a perfect or imperfect authentic? Imperfect, bell is correct, because we've got the root here, and the third up here, which means we still have somewhere more to go. I mean, if it wasn't already obvious by the fact that we started the measure on on a non chord tone, the result up, is that that wasn't enough of a clue that we had somewhere else to go. Here's another example. Here's the key, C major. Here's the example. is the melody is actually so regardless of who you're looking at the melody itself which is being sung because it's a fun piece versus the piano part neither of them are on scale of one we're not there yet so here's an example we're in C major still we're going to start on an A minor triad don't let it throw you off. We're going to end on the C chord. So I want you to figure out what type of cadence. When did the cadence happen, though? I'm going to give you two situations. You tell me which one is true. That the cadence either, either starts when the last measure starts or the cadence starts uh, when the last chord happens. That's scenario one. The cadence ends, uh, the cadence is when the measure starts. Uh, example uh, two, it would be if you think the cadence happens on the last chord. happen here? Or did the cadence happen here? Because this is a situation where there might not necessarily be an incorrect answer as much as an answer that's more correct and that you can make your answer correct through uh, the way that you would perform the piece. I would be more along the lines of this is the cadence because that's a little bit easier to quantify what that was, uh, which would be, this is an inverted leading tone chord. So a 7-6 leading to 1. And regardless, even if the cadence happens here, still definitely not a 5 chord, so it's a leading tone chord. In either case, then we end up with an imperfect authentication.